tuatahi tautoa na mahi mahia kia rātou mā, kia tātou hoki ngā hunga ora te ngā tātou katoa mahi ki te haukainga ngā te whātua te ngā koutou te ngā koutou te ngā koutou ngā koutou mātou i o ngā mātou wake e tiaki e manaki i rongi koutou whenua nō reira he mahi mutu ngā kori tēnei kia koutou huri ngā te whari tēnā tātou katoa ko Taranaki te maunga ko Waitara te awa Ko te ati awa, ko ngā ati mahanga, ko ngā mahanga tairi ōku iwi, ko ngā ati rāhiri tōku hapu, anei te tai mokopuna o te maunga tītohia, mihi atu. Kia koutou i tēnei ata. E tukana tēnā, ko te mea tuatahi he māmā hau, te rāte mahi nui, mōku. Pirangau ki te mihi hoki kia koutou, e te tana koutou mā i whakatū i te kohanga reo. Kia John, me te whānau o Waipereira, mō koutou manaki e ki ngā whānau ki te rataha. Ki o koe tuakana, o te maunga, ko a tau mai nei, ki ko nei a ngā rupi. I mea mai kei ai a taku tuara, nō reira, mihi tēnei kia koe. Koutou a katoa, tēnā koutou. It's actually really hard to follow something like that, even, um, you know, because I think John might have gone, but he's so kind of boom, 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 boom. Um, and I'm sitting there getting kind of dizzy watching him. Um, I'm thinking, gosh, I wish they had an optometrist, because um, my, one of my babies, I, I'm, I'm Ngāti Mahanga and I'm Ngā Mahanga Tairi, so I have twins, two sets. Um, and one of my little baby twins, the other day, and it's a kind of Tamariki story, she was jumping on the trampoline and I turned around and she just jumped straight at me and these very expensive progressive glasses snapped. And, um, and I just went to look for my glasses, forgetting that she had jumped and so she just went poof on the ground. <laughs> and then she stood up, saw my glasses had broken and I think this is a very kaupapa Māori thing, she said, he pai nē māma, he aitua noiho. You know? And for those who don't speak, I mean, what she was saying to me is, it's okay that I broke your glasses, because it was just an accident. Kariko he raru, so it's not an issue. And then I looked at her and realised, actually, I'd forgotten even to catch her. So I have to keep chopping and changing glasses. So if I wear these, I can't see what I've written. And if I wear these, I can't see you. Um, <laughs> I can barely see neither and other bit. Um, so eyes are an issue. Um, I kind of feel like I'm a little bit in a... I'll put these on so I can see you. Um, a little bit in a... Uh, I feel like I should be a kind of AA. Yeah, Academics Anonymous. Um, I am an academic. And, um, but first and foremost, I'm a Māori. I'm a Māori woman, and that's actually where everything that I do uh, as an academic comes to play. And you know, I know that in, when we talk about whānau, when we talk about our own whānau and the well-being of our own whānau, that often you know, many, many academics, both past and present, get in the way, and not only agencies, but researchers and academics, and many of us have a role to intervene in that uh, on behalf of our own whānau, hapu and iwi. And that is all about our well-being. And there's a kind of story about an hour presentation I want to talk about a little bit later. But in the past few days, someone needs to time me and go like this when I'm nearly up. Because I, I don't wear a watch, because I don't really believe that much in time. So Heather's going to go <laughs> flash at me. But in the past couple of few days, I've been at a, uh, an academic conference, an educational conference, um, the New Zealand Association for Research and Education, it's called. And a part of what we do in that conference is that we always have a hui ao Māori, a iwi, uh, for a day or two before that. And so Tauranga Moana hosted a hui ao iwi uh, for kairangahau of the region and for those of us who are going down to the conference. And, and it's around, talking about the kind of interventions, really, that John was talking about um, in terms of intervening in schooling particularly so that it is more fruitful uh, for our children. 
And even with national standards, which I totally disagree with John, national standards have really no validity in terms of measuring our children. Uh, it's just another imposed Western framework of telling our kids how good or bad they are. And generally, they tell us how bad we are. So we really don't need that. Uh, if we're going to be looking at frameworks, we need to look at frameworks that are based within our own process, within kaupapa and Māori process. And really, that's what I'm an advocate for, whether it doesn't matter what sector it's in, is around kaupapa and Māori. It's around developing our ways of doing things through our deal, with our deal, with our whānau, uh, with our hapū, with our iwi, with our urban organisations that are grounded within what we do. And that was really the focus of the hui a Māori uh, in terms of Māori researchers. Um, down there, but also prior to that, a few weeks ago, I'd been to a Māori health hui. And really, um, when John was talking about the different sectors and how they talk past each other, I actually think that as Māori, we, we don't and we don't need to. Those that do, don't need to. Because if we take a fundamental kaupapa, it actually doesn't matter what sector you're in. It doesn't matter whether you're health. It doesn't matter whether you're education. It doesn't matter whether you're justice. Kaupapa Māori transcends those areas because actually those areas are not our areas. Those ways of looking at the world are not our ways of looking at the world. Those are imposed ways of looking at the world. We don't have to buy into the boundaries. We don't have to buy into the way in which they demarcate what we do. And in fact, when you look at the model uh, that John was providing and that other uh, Iwi and urban authorities are working on, they are about cutting across all of those areas and bringing them into a place where they're actually informing and um, working with each other. The other thing I just wanted to raise is that um, in the past few weeks, again, we've had a real burst of media around child abuse and child murder, really the fact that, again, a number of our babies have been murdered at the hands of our own. Um, and we've been, again, re-inundated with those, with those images. And, I mean, I would think most, like me, in this room become very kind of overcome with that, with a sense of sadness and a sense of disgust at times and a sense of anger. And... I just want to talk a little bit about what happens when we don't have those images in the media. What happens in terms of whānau well-being when we don't have those images in the media. And what happens is nothing happens. We have a whole media machine that is not at all committed to providing information or education or positivity around what we need to do to intervene. We become the subject of media only when we kill our babies. And there's a real indictment on a, and it's on a basic neoliberal system of broadcasting that continues to enable that to happen. We're actually public good broadcasting, information is not actually a part of what we see in the mainstream media. And I will say, in terms of Māori television, that there is a move in Māori television, but it is also tends to be in a profile role modelling sense. It is not necessarily in a really informative sense. And so I think there is a challenge to Māori media to really step up and actually provide a whole range of being and knowledge and information in a whole range of ways, in rap, in rangatahi ways, in pakeke ways, in kuiakaro and kaumatua ways, in a whole range of ways that actually inform us and not keep waiting till the next baby is killed. Don't wait till the next baby is killed for us to hear anything about child wellbeing. And so a few weeks ago, we had a child poverty program on TV3. Now, I'm assuming that many of you watched that program. Um, the timing of that program was quite exceptional. It was right smack in the last couple of weeks of the election. Um, I have no idea who the programmer was that put it there, but it definitely had an impact in the last few weeks of campaigning around child welfare. There's just no doubt about that. 
But that's probably one of the few programs of documentaries that we've actually seen that have engaged, has engaged child poverty in a really complex way. I guess one of my um, concerns is the way in which we get these really simplistic messages about how to deal with well-being and how to promote well-being. So I was thinking about that list that was read. Sorry, I don't. Terrible. I don't know the chief commissioner's name. Is it David? Carl. Carl Davidson. That's right, it's the same name as Madama. Um, I was thinking about that list that Carl was talking about in terms of young, being young, being single, being on benefit, being away from whānau, um, having a non-biological partner, that these things culminate into vulnerability. And actually, I want to say those things do not culminate into vulnerability. Those things do not uh, have an end product if you are all those things, whereby you are going to have a child who's killed or where you're going to um, do some harm to yourself or your whānau. Because of those things, they, those are not the things that culminate into an, out, uh, into a, an outcome of child abuse. What creates a culmination into an outcome of child abuse in that context is much more complex than saying to someone, you're single, you're young, you're Māori, you're a woman, uh, you're on a benefit, therefore you, you, you are the problem. And we get that kind of problem, problemizing, uh, problemizing of young people around things like teen parenting, around rangatahi. Those things are all constructed views, they're all cultural views, they're actually not our views. In Araumua, when we didn't live past kind of 45, we were all teen parents, all of us. And what worked is because we had tikanga, we had kaupapa, we had structures around us that were enabling of us. We had whānau that was not referred to as family. Whānau is not family. I'm really sick to death of whānau slash family happening. Whānau is not family, and if we're going to treat whānau like it's a nuclear family, then we're going to continue to get the kind of issues we get. Whānau is extended. Whānau is multiple. Whānau is many, many generations working together. Whānau is collective. And I, I wrote a master's thesis in 1991 where I challenged exactly that thing around a program called Parents as First Teachers. They talked about whānau as if it was the same thing as a nuclear family. Well, it's not. And unless we move away from that context, we're going to end up with the same old, same old. And that's actually sad, because whānau is very much our context, it's very much our term, uh, it's very much our way of defining our interrelationships. So the child uh, poverty, I just want to go back to the child poverty document. I'm kind of going to go all over the place. Um, it was very long awaited. It raised a whole lot of issues around housing, around access to medical care. It showed a whole range of complexity of child poverty, and it advocated that it's actually not an easy fix. It's not a quick fix situation. And it can never be about continuing to focus on what people would call a deficit view or the deficiencies of whānau uh, in terms of how in terms of how we are living, or in terms of how we raise our children. That's an old term. We've come through, if we don't understand the complexity of our historical context, we have come through a huge, huge disruption for our whānau, an endless disruption. Colonisation did not end last week or last year. It is ongoing. It is ongoing. And actually, we can see systemically how colonisation is ongoing when we see that the Kohanga del Trust is taking a claim for its survival. That is actually not right. That was Fano initiative. That was Hapu Iwi initiative. That was Māori initiative. There should not even be a question of the survival of that initiative. There should be a question of the systemic ways in which those initiatives are imposed uh, have imposed ways of being upon them that make it difficult to operate. And in many ways, that's what you know, I saw in John's presentation. Is that, you know, they actually have a very powerful organisation, a very large organisation, and so they can take on the local governments and all of those things. And so they do need to become voices for our whānau. But it indicates very clearly that the issues are systemic. The one thing I want to say about the poverty, and, uh, and, and don't, um, 
don't think that I don't, didn't think it was a great documentary. I thought it was a very powerful documentary, but it was also a very Pākehā documentary. It was a very Western-framed documentary. I don't even remember them hearing the word Māori more than a couple of times, or Pacific a couple of times. And when we're talking about 400,000 children in poverty, 50% of those children are our kids. The Māori and Pacific kids, we are far, far over-represented represented in the poverty statistics. And we, can look, we know that neoliberalism has an impact. We know that the economy has an impact. We know that housing has an impact. We know that all those things have an impact. But so does racism have an impact. Racism is a powerful systemic force against our people accessing what we need to have to be well. And I'm talking about systemic racism, institutional racism, and I'm also talking about really fundamental personal racism. I was just talking to someone from the Families Commission. At the moment, I'm looking for a new rental property uh, in another city. But the last time I looked for a rental property in Auckland, it took me eight houses to find a rental property. It would take me and my six kids. And most of the time, as soon as they saw me, it was no longer available. Now, we used to hear about this in the 60s and 70s. It's that, that, not different. It's no different. It's not different. 30, 30, 40 years later, we still end up with that kind of context. And what happens is that many of our people end up in dive, unhealthy, mouldy, cold, damp housing. And that includes state housing on the whole. So, you know, personal racism continues. And, you know, hell, I'm a relatively well-off. I'm a doctor. I've got all the degrees you can have. And yet still, by just a fundamental personal racism, people have a view of who you are when they see you. So in terms of going back to the discussion around child poverty, and um, yeah, there is a real, um, I do agree with John's notion that we need to have success-oriented programs and that we need to be operating in that way. And I think that within this room, there are people that need to be doing that. But I also think that there are people that need to be continually engaging and discussing and arguing back against the negativity with which we're presented. So we cannot be talking about child poverty in terms of only an economic framework. And I really agree with Tully, and I always have on this point that she's made, that it is not only in the, in the DVD, this is not only an economic issue, this is not only a monetary issue. There are a whole range of things that come to play. And when we talk about looking pathways forward, you know, looking for pathways forward, and you know, every agency is looking for answers, actually, in my heart, I believe we have the answers. And I think that we have had them for a very, very long time. I think that the answers to issues now way precede us. They are thousands of years old. They are within Te Kanga. They are within Mātauranga Māori. They are within Te Reo Māori. They way precede us being here. But they're not actually the answers that successive governments want to hear. They're not the right answers within agencies or ministries. So actually, our issue is not whether we have the answers. Our issue is that we're continually fighting a colonial system that don't like the answers we have. And the last election shows we're actually fighting 50% of the population in this country who also don't like the answers we have. Because this government has now gone very right wing, more right wing than it was even in the last three years. And you know, the phoenix rose with Winston, Man, incredible. But it rose because he sent her right. They would, he would never have re-risen if he was on the left. It rose because right-wing people who don't want to sell assets are still looking for another right-wing party, and there was no one available until Winston re-emerged. So we're actually dealing with a, really, uh, with a system with a, which is actually going to get worse for our people in terms of that sense. And the thing that really disturbed me in the election 
process is that even Māori politicians began to talk about poverty. Child abuse, I uh, went to the Tāmaki um, debate. Uh, Cindy Keel put a question around poverty, child poverty and child abuse. The response was raising the minimum wage. And we should raise the minimum wage. But that ain't the only answer. And we're talking about four Māori campaigning who all basically bought into this notion that child abuse is entirely about poverty. And it, it is about poverty, but it's not only about economic poverty. And I was talking to Ngāruki last night and she was talking about it's a poverty of spirit. It's a poverty of knowledge. It's a poverty of tikanga. It's a poverty of fana. It's a poverty of knowing. And so when we talk about changing the way we think and the way we know, that is really critical to understanding how to move things. But actually, I've always believed that we have the answers. And they are kaupapa Māori answers. And they are about the, those processes of whanaungatanga that are based upon being Māori. And actually, you don't, we don't all have to be fluent in te reo to be able to do that. It's a bonus, and I think it's an aim, an objective we should have. But I come from a family where, from 10 kids, you know, eight of the, one passed away, so seven of the nine of us never did any of them. There are two of us, we stand out like sore thumbs. But when it comes to talking about things Māori, the other seven will take on board what we have to offer. And when I look at them and the way that we were raised, seven people, because we came from quite a, quite a violent kind of family background, that was our experience, of the nine of us, not one of us smack our children, not one. And I'm thinking, what happened in that intergenerational shift? Because we made conscious choices not to do that. Seven of them that only speak English have the most incredible ability to manaki to tiaki, to whāngai, to do all of the fundamental principles of being Māori. So there's actually an in in that for all of us, whether we have that or we have access to tikanga, we have that knowledge or not, because they are fundamentally good values around how to operate. But I really do want to come back to the whole notion of the way in which we talk about whānau. And I've had, you know, I've been really angsting, this is the kind of both the Māori and the academic in me, I've been really angsting over this term, um, vulnerable. Uh, vulnerable whānau, working with vulnerable whānau, working with vulnerable children. And I, I, I have a real difficulty with the term. I find it a really problematic term. And if anything, I'd really want us to find some other terms. And when I, uh, the kai kōrero, uh, the last one, when he spoke, he talked about terms like whakapakari, whakanui, whakamana, wera ahutanga, which are about recontexting within our own again. And so, you know, I have my own sense of what the term uh, vulnerable means, and it just, for me, it locates a weakness. A weakness in our whānau and a weakness in our children that we need protection. And I find that very paternalistic, that notion of being vulnerable and requiring protection. Um, or being helpless, all the terms that conjure up well, the notion of vulnerable, vulnerable means. And yeah, even if we think about that child poverty documentary and the child poverty group work, what they tell us is actually it's a systemic issue. It's about power. It's about oppression. And for us as Māori, it's about colonisation. And I know a lot of people think we should be over that by now, but hey, look at our statistics, we ain't over it. And one of the things we talked about in the education forum uh, on Tuesday was that if education uh, just needs some tinkering with and it worked for us, 
we would not be where we are today. We've had two, we've given them 200 years. The first school was established in 1816 in Dangihaua, the first mission school. They've had nearly 200 years to do it right by our whanau, and they haven't. 200 years is a pretty long pilot, really. <laughs> yeah, it's time to intervene. And the term vulnerable really connects to another term, because I think that there's a real obsession generally within ministries and governments around finding a new term and grabbing it and it becoming the term. So in health, the term is resilience. It's quite good going across sectors and not being too tied by any, you know, because like we can't go into health and they go, you're not a tutu the Māori health researcher. We go, we're Māori. You know, so being able to move across sectors, you see how things, terms go between sectors. The term resilience has been the hot term in health for a very long time. And like the term vulnerable, it's a really problematic term, but we use it every day. We say we want resilient whānau. We're going to develop, develop resilience in our whānau. Resilience is basically a process of springing back. And, and from when I first uh, heard the term used in Māori health, it kind of reminded me, I don't know if you've seen some kind of, you know, weird, oh, actually Westies do this. They have those spring things on their dashboards, you know, those spring doll things, and they go back and forward. If you're, you know, hey, you must have seen it on Outrageous Fortune. Um, that, that's what resilience reminds me of. If you flick it, it springs back. But it springs back to the same place. It never progresses. It only ever comes back to the same place. It's about actually being able to live within what you have. It's about saying, we as in our colonial system are going to keep beating you and you're going to be able to still stand up. That's what resilience for me means. You're going to keep standing up. And so I talked to a mate in Wellington around the term, and we were doing all these descriptions around spring dolls, and she said, oh, it just reminds me of a Coke machine. I was like, I didn't quite get that one. But she said, you know, Coke machines, if you don't get your bottle out, you push it, and it rocks. Eh? Oh, obviously, not many of you have been in the position where you've had to do this. <laughs> but I'm from Waitara, and we do it. <clears throat> okay. So it rocks. And she said, you know, and then you push it, and it rocks, but it always comes back. But if you push it hard enough, it will fall. And it won't rock back. So how far do we push our whānau to the extent that they rock back and then they fall? That's what colonisation does. And for me, resilience is not enough. It's not enough to be resilient. It's not enough to still be able to stand up. Because that does not fulfil all of those things that um, people talked about on the DVD. The DVD was very clear. All of the Māori on the DVD, all of those speakers on the DVD talked about being Māori, talked about being clear in our identity, talked about the fact we have the answers. Being able to stand up and just stand up before you fall over is not enough. So, I, I mean, I would like some discussion around the term vulnerable in terms of our whānau, because... I don't think it's enough for us to be asserting that we can spring back. And Ngāropi said today, you know, what they look at in Tūtama Wahine is where are the points of resistance that our whānau have? Where are those points of resistance to being the way we're told that we're meant to be or to operating in certain ways? And that is the strength-based position, is in that resistance. I just want to talk, um, I'm just going to finish off pretty well here, but I want to talk about one thing. See, Ngāropi and I chatted last night, so everything changed. And um, we talked last night about well-being. We were talking about well-being of our whānau. And that a lot of the discussions that we have around the poverty uh, are things like we can't feed our children. We're not able to feed our children. 
and that's a reality. And actually, you know, I was fortunate to have three months in Seattle, uh, and the you know the, uh, the economic push there is such that it's getting worse and worse. And I can see that really uh, being imported here more and more. The fact that we can't feed our children is not just because we don't have the money to feed the children. It's many, many things. And when we did a presentation a couple of weeks, for those of you who um, are really, there will be many of you who are familiar with the treaty process, why six was the Motunui outfall that Ada Taylor took 30 years this year, 1981. Killed all of our beds, all of our Kaimwana beds around the entire Motunui Waitara, all of the reefs. Uh, two or three weeks ago, we had a hui uh, with a panel, an advisory panel, where the iwi presented back why the district council should not be given an extension to use that marine outfall for 30 more years. Now for us it just seems nonsensical that they would even be considering doing that. When in 1981 the tribunal said this should be short term and should be changed. So uh, in the last couple of days the council have been given an extension for 30 years to use the outfall as a backup. So why can't we feed our children? Well, in that context, we used to eat as kids off those reefs all the time. I grew up eating off those reefs. We grew up walking to that beach. Uh, my father was a freezing worker. He was a sole earner in our family. There were nine kids in a, um, what was in a native housing, uh, pepper potting into town. And we would walk down like little ducklings in a row. It's quite, I used to think it was quite funny like the tuak and the down to the baba, because you could get six power each. And it was really in case the old inspector was down the beach. So we would all go down, kind of waddling down to the beach. He would go out with the big ones and we would watch. But we ate all the time off those reefs. My six children have never eaten off those reefs. Fano lived in the, uh, off that awa, have lived off those reefs. That, that's not peculiar to that region. It goes across all of our regions. So even in a recession period, you could still feed your family. You could still feed your family. So the inability to feed our family is to do with minimum wage, but it's not only to do with minimum wage. It's to do with a whole lot of other processes that have removed us from an ability to feed our farmer and to feed each other. And the schooling, I just wanted to say around the schooling context that we've come through in 200 years has taught us to be very good individuals. And that was the aim. The aim of native schooling was to undermine the whānau. All of our settlements are operating at treaty level in terms of a rejuvenation and then to whānau. But actually the colonisers did not come and attack our iwi. They came and attacked our whānau. So we're actually trying to replace something that has been viciously attacked for 200 years. We're trying to support something that's been viciously attacked for 200 years. And schooling, as an educationalist, has had a huge role to play in the individualising of our thought, the privatisation of our thought. There are many, many ways in which it's happened. The nuclearisation of family and our thought, the domestication, the gendered issues in terms of the treatment of our women and children, they're all part of the package. So it's a really big package. But actually, even with that, within that are the answers. Within that same package are the answers. And uh, for me, it is about returning to the fundamentals of kaupapa Māori approaches and I don't mean a universal Māori either. Because Fano, Hapu and Iwi have our own tikanga, we have our own kawa, we have our own ways of doing it. And as Māori, we actually can unify to support each other. And that's always been very entrenched in my thinking. Uh, and I guess it's partly coming because 
Taranaki kawa is so distinctive to us. So even when we talk, and even when I've talked about kaupapa Māori, I've never thought about it as a universalising idea. It's always been about internally we have our own ways of doing things and strengthening things. So I think that we do already have the answers uh, and that there are providers and organisations that are doing that and that we do need to continue on that pathway. And that pathway is actually a decolonising pathway. It's a decolonising pathway. And it's not only about money, but it is entirely about thinking. So, kia ora tātou.